welcome to Mosaic. I'm your host, Susan Shulman Pertnoy. Mosaic is Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County's weekly news magazine, exploring the most critical issues facing Jews here and around the world. Antisemitism is on the rise. So how should Jews respond to this growing threat? We're sitting down with Deborah Lipstadt, internationally known historian, scholar, and author of a new book about antisemitism here and now. We'll be right back with Mosaic. You are the book that lights the spark and the hand that passes the torch, the fuel that powers the change that betters the world across town, across oceans, the hand that soothes the spirit that survived the unthinkable. You are there in the darkest of times to strengthen our community. Good Greek moving in storage. Your superhero movers. More moving horror stories. Think it's a good idea for your friends to show up at Pizza and Pier to help you move? Wrong. Uh, Amateurs. Is there a real mover out there? As a former police officer, I've heard all of the moving horror stories. But you can trust me and my pros, and we'll have you saying, Opa! Call Star Star Greek. Good Greek, moving in storage. Your superhero movers. The Levin Palace at Morse Life is leasing luxury residences for ages 65 plus, offering more than first-class amenities and white glove service. Life at the Palace is like life aboard a luxury cruise ship with more things to enjoy life now. More fabulous food, more fun, more friends, more family, more freedom, more future. Morse Life is more life. Live it at the Palace. Start your fabulous future now. Call 561-537-3402. Joining us today is Professor Deborah Lipstadt, a well-renowned Holocaust expert and author. As a matter of fact, one of her books resulted in a libel case that was the inspiration for the 2016 movie production of Denial, starring Rachel Weisz. Deborah has just written a new book called Antisemitism Here and Now, and it's hot off the press. Just this morning, she won the National Jewish Book Award. Correct. Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's a thrill and honor to have you on Thank our show. You. Thank again, you. Again, to be on the show yes, again. Yes, actually, That's right. yes. What possessed you to write this book? In um, about 2014, even before the war in Gaza, but certainly during the war in Gaza and afterwards, I just noticed more expressions of anti-Semitism coming from different places, uh, coming from in different directions, not just related to Israel, and I began to be concerned. So after the war, about mid-August, I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times, which started with the old Jewish joke, many of your list, watch, uh, viewers will, will know it, uh, what's the definition of a Jewish telegram? Start worrying, details follow, you know? <laughs> And I said, I, I, for one, have always eschewed worrying. I think people worry too much. I think we Jews are, are comfortable at the oi end of the spectrum as opposed to the joy end of the spectrum. But I was seeing things that were bothersome. So the article got tremendous, tremendous amount of attention. And my agent, my literary agent, called me and said, well, where's the book proposal? I assume this is a book. And I said, no, I just wrote the article. He said, well, write a book proposal. So I wrote a couple of pages. Um, and he sold it, and I had to write the book. I didn't start writing the book, I would say, because I had another book that I was finishing at the time, uh, until about 2015, end of 2015, the beginning of 2016. And by then, there was no question that I thought that it was necessary. But uh, I'll tell you, in terms of people's reactions, when I first started to write the book, even in, in late 2015, a lot of people said to me, do we really need a book on anti-Semitism? When the book came out a few months ago, they stopped, they didn't ask me anymore. And now some of those same people are saying, well, are you gonna do an updated version, so. It's sad, but very yeah. necessary. But why did you decide to um, explain anti-Semitism through the use of fictional letters mm. and fictional characters to discuss factual issues? Oh, I started out writing the book and it was, I just couldn't get my head around how to do it. 
I, I was doing country by country, but that was more, almost more like an atlas, a historical atlas than anything interesting. Then I started to do it chronologically, but it was going in so many different directions. And a friend of mine, uh, who's a well-published author, had read, knew I was having problems. She said, try letters, and it just worked. And what's interesting, and you're correct in saying that the two characters are fictional characters, they're composites, even though I've had students come up to me and say, you based that on me, didn't you? And faculty members say, you based that on X, Y, Z. They're really composites of people. But what's interesting is that the characters are fictional, but everything they ask me and every anecdote they tell me is, is true. So in other words, sometimes you get historical characters speaking fiction. Here we have fictional characters speaking the of, a fact of what actually has been asked of me. And I'm very pleased because the book has not only gotten a very warm reception from uh, a, ver a wide arrange, array, of, array of readers, uh, but many parents are giving it to their children or grandchildren in anticipation of their going off to college. And something you should understand. Oh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not an academic read. It's a, it's a, it really covers the, a wide right. audience. Well, it's, a, it's, it's, it's written as a book to be accessible to everyone. But for the academics and the scholars, it's got 30 pages of footnotes <laughs> and notes. <laughs> So did anything surprise you during your research and while you wrote Surprised the book? Surprised me not, though times I was shocked. Oh. You know, there were incidents that shocked me when you read about the extent. And uh, one of the final paragraphs I wrote in the book, because I kept adding stuff, because more things kept happening, um, was, you know, my, my editor said, we have to have it. It's got to go to press. We have to have the manuscript. Um, was that, though I'm, I'm not a prophet, I'm a historian, so I deal with what was and not what is. Uh, but I'm willing to predict that by the time this book appears, something will have happened that should have been included. And then six weeks later came Pittsburgh. So I wasn't surprised by Pittsburgh, but I was shocked. Yeah, yeah. To, par to paraphrase Justice Potter Stewart, mm -hmm. I know it when I see it, but I can't necessarily define it. Mm -hmm. Define antisemitism. Okay, sure, because many Jews know it when they see it, but many non-Jews as well. I would say that there's a template for the stereotypes of anti-Semitic charges. Every prejudice has its particular stereotypes, and anti-Semitism is no different. And the template, I would say, contains three or four elements. One, something to do with money. Jews are rich, Jews are very control this financially, whatever it might be. The second one is smarts, but not smarts in the sense of intellect or uh, positive smarts, but cunning. Uh, smarts used for malicious or nefarious purposes. And the third is power above their weight. Too many Jews, they're, you know, they're a small number, but they control too many spots. You know, we never say that about uh, Catholics, but we might say that about Jews or things like that. And then it, you put those together, and the other element that is, is so distinctive is a conspiracy. That Jews are not just to be loathed, but to be feared. That they're conspiring against the rest of us in the society. So those would be the elements I would look for in, in, in terms of anti-Semitism. So what are the origins of anti-Semitism? Uh, I would say the origins for that template are the New Testament and the way in which the material in the New Testament was used and interpreted over millennia, particularly during the Middle Ages, in terms of demonizing the Jew. It didn't have to be that way. I'm not saying the New Testament is essentially anti-Semitic. I'm not saying that at all. But the way that material, those stories of the crucifixion of Jesus, that the Jews killed Jesus. Of course, Jesus was a Jew, and everybody in the story is Jewish, except the Romans who actually kill him. Um, in order, because he wanted to uh, chase the money changers out of the temple. So, and they convinced Rome, they got Rome, the most powerful entity in the world, to do it. Uh, the, um, and, and that story and those charges take their shape, early Middle Ages and through the Middle Ages, as church leaders want to differentiate Christianity from Judaism, as they want to demonize the Jew, make the Jew the enemy. We have to take a quick break. Okay. We'll be right back with Deborah Lipstadt. Coming up, author and historian Deborah Lipstadt weighs in on the current rise of antisemitism.
You are the book that lights the spark and the hand that passes the torch, the fuel that powers the change that betters the world across town, across oceans, the hand that soothes the spirit that survived the unthinkable. You are there in the darkest of times to strengthen our community. Eat, drink, and enjoy Shabbat services at Temple Beth El's Friday Night Happenings. Cocktail reception and kosher dinner at 5.30, followed by our creative, musically-driven Shabbat service. Traditional to progressive, the food and music change every Friday, and you'll want to stay for complimentary dessert. Plan to spend the whole evening here, and you'll walk away and you'll say, Wow, we're coming back next week. Welcome at Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat services at Temple Beth El. Open to everyone. Join us every Friday night. Are you concerned about the rise of anti-Semitism and other challenges facing the Jewish community? Join us in doing something about it. Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County has a variety of opportunities for you to stand up for what you care about by advocating, volunteering, learning, and connecting. Visit jewishpalmbeach.org upcoming for a full list of opportunities coming up near you. More moving horror stories. Slick salesmen make you a great deal. Sleazy movers hold everything hostage until you pay a higher fee. As a former police officer, I've heard all of the moving horror stories. But you can trust me and my pros, and we'll have you saying, Opa! Call Star Star Greek. Good Greek, moving in storage. Your superhero movers. We're back with Deborah Lipstadt discussing the origins of anti-Semitism. And we were talking about the churches. Well, the, the, what happened was the church in the Middle Ages, in an effort, and the Middle Ages are very long, um, <laughs> in an effort to differentiate Christianity from Judaism, in an effort to uh, show that Jews were unenlightened and blinded to the truth, and if they were really open to the truth, they would adopt Christianity. Uh, not only demonize Judaism, but demonize the Jew. And you, know, you can see the change in Martin Luther in the 16th century. Martin Luther assumed when he was creating this protest against the, the, what's the Catholic Church, that the Jews would, would come to him, would flock to him, because his, his critique of the church and his critique of anti-Semitism didn't happen. So 20 years later, when he's very disappointed by that, first he writes an essay in the 20 years earlier about uh, you know, the Jews will adopt this because how horribly they've been treated by the pope, papists, etc. And then when they don't, he writes the most virulent anti-Semitic tract. Now, the, his, his, the Jews' behavior hadn't changed over 20 years, but, but he just falls back on the stereotypes. Why, why do you think anti-Semitism has withstood the test of time? Uh, I think it's so deep in the society. It's so old. I mean, for some reason, I'm not, I'm not really answering the why. But when something gets its roots so down deep, it's very hard to eradicate. It's not something new. You know, we've, we've, people talk about Islamophobia or fear of Muslims. That's something fairly recent. That's something fairly new. I'm not justifying it at all, of course. Um, but anti-Semitism has such old, such deep roots. You see it in Shakespeare. Shakespeare wrote uh, Merchant of Venice when there hadn't been a Jew in, in, in England for 400 years, so he's working off his stereotypes. You see it in Dickens, uh, uh, you know, in, Ol in um, Oliver Twist. Uh, you see it in so many different ways that, that even someone who doesn't consider themselves anti-Semitic or isn't anti-Semitic, someone says something bad about Jews, they stop and they think, well, I've heard that before. So you get that kind of thing. So in your book, you discuss four elements or four types of anti-Semitism. Extremism, uh, the dinner party anti-Semite, mm. a clueless anti-Semite, and an enabler, the person that mm -hmm. stirs the pot. Right. Can you define these sure. for us? The extremist is the person who, uh, you know, swastikas and uh, Hitler-like, and uh, just like in kin in racism, it would be the person in the Ku Klux Klan outfit. The, the extremist is the person in Pittsburgh, the person in Easily Hala. identified. Easily identified and easily hated and condemned. 
The dinner party is the polite anti-Semite, the person who says, oh, uh, we've had Jewish neighbors move in next door, but they're very nice and they're very honest and, and they're, you know, or I just hired a Jewish associate, but he's very honest and hardworking. That's anti-Semitism. These people aren't like the rest. You know, it's the some of my best friends are Jews kind yeah. of thing. Um, the third one is the enabler. Um, and the enabler is the one who themselves may not be Jewish, but stirs up the pot. And very often we see this in politics. It may not be anti-Semitic, but stirs up the pot. And very often we see this in politics, uh, where the person, you know, it, it, it's not exactly what they believe, but this works. So I'm going to engage in it. And we've seen that. Well, it also, in, I mean, recently it incites... Incites hatred, it yeah. incites divisions. And you see it on the right and the left. Uh, there's no differentiation between it coming from the right and coming from the left. The the people in you know who the extremists are all on the far right, and that the Jews are you know uh, trying to replace Christians and et cetera et cetera. And on the left, that the Jews are claiming to be victims when they're not. And then you have the clueless anti-Semite, and that's the person who doesn't even know that they're engaging in anti-Semitism. Can you give us an uh, example? Yeah, I'll give you an example of you know someone who will say. Uh, a group of people sitting around and having lunch, and there's one Jew amongst them, and they're talking about a big sale, great sale, we can get terrific bargains. And they turn, she turns to the Jewish person, this happened to a friend of mine, and says, you're really going to be interested in this. So, and, and at that point, my friend was very quick, said, you know, sometimes you can't think of the right answer till two o'clock in the right. morning, the next morning, said, I didn't know Jews were the only ones smart enough to want to save their hard-earned money. The woman certainly got it, you know. <laughs> but that's, so. or, you know, or you, you Jews would be, or you Jews stick together, or you Jews kind of thing. You know, there are Jews who stick together, and there are Jews who don't stick together. There are Jews who are wealthy, and there are Jews who are not wealthy. There are Jews on the left, there are Jews on the right. There are nice Jews, and there are Jews I don't like. But the minute you ascribe to a whole group one characteristic, that's prejudice, and that, in this case, is Jew hatred. Thank you. We're going to take another break. We'll be right back after this brief message. Coming up, author and historian Deborah Lipstadt on the current brand of antisemitism that's pervasive on college campuses. You are the book that lights the spark and the hand that passes the torch the fuel that powers the change that betters the world across town, across oceans. The hand that soothes the spirit that survived the unthinkable. You are there in the darkest of times to strengthen our community. Picture living aboard a luxury cruise ship with first-class service and the best amenities 24-7. Life at Tradition is just like a cruise ship that doesn't leave port. With more fabulous food, more fun with friends and family, a more fulfilling future, more care when you need it, and more freedom when you don't. Our elegant assisted living residences provide so much more, so you can make the most of every day. Rent an apartment at Morse Life and see how much more life can be. What's the best kept secret in new cars? It's that you can get a brand new Mini at Brayman Mini Palm Beach for under $21,000, which includes free maintenance for three years. No kidding. Plus, free membership to the fun Mini Club of South Florida for road trips and autocross, and even more with club room social events. Mini is more than just driving. It's about having fun with the Brayman Mini community. Learn about Brayman Mini at BraymanMini.com. Minis for under $21,000, free maintenance, Mini Club, and Club Brayman benefits. It's a no-brainer. Brayman Mini is the right choice. We're back with Professor Deborah Lipstadt talking about antisemitism and the different types. And I want to ask you, is there a difference between antisemitism on the left wing versus the right wing? There is and there isn't. Antisemites on the right look at Jews, they don't see them as white people, and they see them as engaged in a conspiracy against white Christians to bring black people, brown people, and to destroy Christian culture. Uh, Anti-Semites on the left see Jews as white, see Jews as rich, see Jews as powerful, and therefore it's impossible for them to be victims. And when they say I'm a victim of anti-Semitism, they must be making it up to 
protect Israel, to destroy their enemies politically or whatever it might be. So in that sense, they're different. Where they're the same is that the litany of charges, the stereotype, the template that I talked about at the very beginning is the same. Power, money, conniving, malicious, etc. So those are two of the main sources. And then, of course, there's Islamist uh, anti-Semitism, Islamist extremism, and within segments of the mainstream Muslim community, not all and not everyone, I want to be very careful here, but particularly in Europe, we see anti-Semitism being inculcated either through the internet or through imams and others. We're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about Israel. People criticize Israeli polit policies and politics and they're very critical. At what point does something rise to the level of anti-Semitism? Great question. Criticism of Israeli policies, exactly as you say, is not anti-Semitism, just like criticism of American policies is not anti-Americanism. I would argue a number of things. When there is a myopic focus only on this problem, and that this is the worst problem, and this is the only problem, and that the Jews or the Israelis are singularly responsible for it. Then you have to ask, what's going on here? Or when someone says Israel was born in sin because supposedly it kicked out Palestinian Arabs, and, and they ignore the fact that America had slavery and uh, treatment of Native Americans in Australia, at, in, the, in, uh, in the Aborigines and New Zealand. Right. In so many countries, fine democracies, have treated indigenous people uh, poorly, and, and it's, even if the parallel is not quite exact. But they don't worry, they don't say those countries don't have a right to exist. So you, you have to ask, I'm not saying it makes it all right, that are, but, but you have to ask why this singular focus? And that, that and then when people do that, I have to say, I wonder if that's not, it's coming from an anti-Semitic base. And the final thing I think that when you know it's anti-Semitism is when they use the anti-Semitic stereotypes to, oh, of course, Israel is rich, Israel is powerful, Israel is cunning, Israel does things like, they use the stereotypes that they would generally use in relation to Jews and they put them on Israel. Um, or when they say, you know, well, just let's do away, let's, uh, the, Israel has no right to exist. Uh, well, what happens to the six million Jewish residents of Israel? Where do they go? Oh, well, there should be a, uh, a democratic, uh, you know, state. Maybe Muslims will run it, but uh, they'll live there as a minority. Well, that doesn't happen in most Muslim countries. So when people are blinded in that way to the reality and, and refuse to hear other, other aspects, I have to ask, where is that coming from? You recently had the privilege of giving testimony at a United States conference in Congress on, about global efforts to fight anti-Semitism. Whose responsibility is it to fight it? Is it really just a Jewish problem? It's not, look, it's not a Jewish problem. Uh, just like rape is not a woman's problem. And racism should not be a problem of racial minorities. It should be the problem of the perpetrator. You know, but the truth is it's the victim who bleeds. So uh, it's the victim who is going to be more inclined to respond. But unless Jews and non-Jews, unless Jews and others engage in this in a joint effort, uh, we're not going to solve it. Uh, we're not going to resolve it. We're not going to improve it. Uh, I think there are grassroots things that can be done uh, in terms of speaking out speaking out against racism, speaking out, out against anti-Semitism. I just read an effort in New York where a group of Orthodox Jews set up a little coffee stand and gave out rugelach, you know, uh, in, in East Harlem, just to talk to a Jew. We don't want anything from you. We just want to talk, get to know us. These are, get to know us, we're Orthodox Jews. Uh, reaching out. You know, our federation has been trying to fight anti-Semitism by intentionally reaching out to interfaith families and other faiths and communities and collaborating with uh, volunteering opportunities throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So that I think that's very important. We also remember that there a good portion of the American Jewish community is Jews of color. Yes. And they feel ground up in the middle. You know, they walk in them into a shul and people say, what are they doing here? Hello, I'm here because I'm Jewish. I came to Davin, you know, I came to be part of the service. I came to say Kaddish. Or they go into their communities of color and they say, oh, they're Jewish. We can't quite trust you. And I think that that's a, it's a good portion of the Jewish community. We've got to learn to listen to one another. We've got to talk to one another. And we've got to speak out and be upfront about challenging this hatred. In your book, you have a chapter on the oi versus the joy. 
I need to end on a happy note. I'm happy to end on a happy <laughs> note. I think one of the things, the final chapter of the book is, is, is uh, uh, less soy, more joy, or something akin to that. And I think it's, it's tremendously important that we not allow anti-Semitism to become the motivating factor in our Jewish identity. We are not Jews because of anti-Semitism. We are Jews despite we say in Hebrew, afal p, despite anti-Semitism. We are Jews because of the heritage we have, because of the beauty of that heritage, how much that heritage is given to the world. In terms of, you look at the, I'm, I'm, I'm located in Washington for this academic year. Look at our founding documents. They are absolutely, have the Torah implicit in them, um, in terms of proclaiming liberty, uh, in terms of doing justice, even if it was flawed justice. We are a people who care so much about justice that the Torah doesn't say do justice, it says pursue justice. And it doesn't say it once, it says it twice. Justice, justice shall you pursue, tzedek, 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 we are We are bearers of an unbelievable heritage. Don't ever let the anti-Semites steal that from us and our fight against them become the motivating factor in our being and doing and, and reveling in our Jewish identity. What a great way to end the program. Thank you, Thank you so You're much welcome. for joining My us. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Mosaic is brought to you by these generous sponsors and underwriters. Learn how you can support Mosaic by visiting jewishpalmbeach.org mosaic.